This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello and welcome to Transformation Ground Control, the podcast for independent digital transformation thought leadership. I'm here with Parisa Noble and welcome to the show, Parisa. Welcome back. Thank you. Excited to be here as always. Likewise. Good to, good to have you. We have, a, we have a great show today. Before we get to our guests, just a real quick update. We're live on YouTube every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, East, Ho- East Coast time in the U.S., uh, 3 p.m. time in London and 11 p.m. in Hong Kong. So if you're interested in watching this on YouTube, you can watch it live with us every every Wednesday at that time. You can also find us on Google, Apple, um, Spotify, all the podcast platforms of, of your preference. You can find us there. So we've got a great show to you, for you today. Uh, we're going to have a few guests on the show. Uh, we're going to have Amanda Patton on the show today who's going to talk a bit about a case study from an e-commerce distribution company and some of the transformation lessons learned that uh, she and our team are going through and the client's going through uh, at that situation. And then we're also going to have Marcus Harris on the show, who's going to talk about uh, ERP failures and lessons from business technology and other sorts of ERP uh, failures and some of the things that we can learn from to make our transformations more successful. And before we get to all those guests, though, we're going to have Brian Potts on the show, who's managing partner and chief client officer of Third Stage Consulting. Uh, Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. I'm glad to have you. So we're at a we're at an interesting time right now. Coming out of this out of the Super Bowl, we're leading up to Valentine's Day. So football and love, I guess, are sort of maybe on our minds. Uh, maybe not all together, all all at once. But uh, th- those two things are on our mind, and uh, we wanted to talk a bit about ERP vendors and how they fit into different situations that we might love. And so, Parisa, you have some questions for Brian that you wanted to cover. So I'll turn over to you. I do. Well, I have to say, first of all, Brian Potts is one of my favorite bloggers on the Third Stage website. The content he puts out is always so interesting. I know he wrote a blog about comparing ERP systems to our favorite beer selection. That was a good one. And he recently put one out that was... Uh, relating ERP systems to our favorite NFL team. So Brian, if I can, I want to talk about that one. Um, You know, you walked through a handful of different NFL teams, a handful of different um, ERP systems. And I'm curious, you know, the first one that you came out of the gate with was Oracle is like the Dallas Cowboys. So tell me a little bit about that. Why is that? So let's think on a global scale. When you ask somebody, in uh, anywhere to you know name a football team besides somebody that's got a, a hardcore fan you know in their city you ask me i'm gonna say denver broncos but if you ask somebody that doesn't have a football team in their hometown and say name an nfl football team one of the first ones that comes out in, in a lot of cases is the dallas cowboys same with erp is if you ask somebody name erps a lot of people that don't know the erp world can't name erp even a lot of people who are in the ERP world struggle when, when you throw it at them to start rattling off names. But Oracle is one that always comes out on the top and it's just a, a, a well-branded name, well-respected. Um, and it's also got, because of that, I think gained a sort of a love-hate relationship with a lot of people. That makes sense. I think it was our last episode, right? Where we were saying, well, I was saying Oracle is like the Tom Brady, but I'll take it. Dallas Cowboys too. I mean, they're great. You're right. I have some friends who, kind of our floaters they're not really into nfl but they claim the cowboys as their team when they're when they're talking about it so that's very true another one you said qad is like the cleveland browns what's that about yeah so kind of a, a flash from the the past it, it's been a while since the browns have made a name they're starting to to come back a little bit and same with qad qad um and what really led to this analogy first and foremost is is the fan base um 
if you go to a QAD conference, for example, you're going to find a, a large number of companies that have been on that platform for 30 plus years that will not move, will never move. They've got a very structured, long-standing client base. Likewise, the Browns, the my brother included, have, have had a, a fan base that doesn't leave. They, they've been through some troubling times. They moved. They went to a new city and they came back and they still have a fan base. That's pretty strong attention to a football team and pretty loyal fan base in both regards. So I thought that was a fair analogy. That is fair. And I, I saw on the blog, you said, welcome to the dog pound. Is that their, is that their saying? <laughs> that is, if you've been, yes, if you've been to a Cleveland game there, <clears throat> the dog pound is a called a rowdy group in the end zone. Oh, that is so funny. That takes me to a tangent. Have you heard of the Bills Mafia? I have, I have not. Oh my gosh. And I didn't, I hadn't heard about it until they just recently were in one of the championships. I don't know which one, but they were there. NFC, and I, or AFC, yeah. I should say. <laughs> okay, <laughs> got it. Thanks, Eric. Uh, they are a little bit crazy. Their tailgating traditions are climbing on top of their car and then jumping onto their table at the tailgate to break it in half. So, I mean, to our listeners, Brian, Eric, you guys got to YouTube this. <laughs> After <laughs> the show, it's ridiculous. Have to but check that out. Fan bases can make or break it, I, I'd say. So, okay, you have a few other ones on here. Um, I'll let our readers go find the blog and read about it, but tell me about your favorite. Which one do you love the most? Which ERP system, and I guess NFL team? Well, that's a tough one because as an independent advisor, I truly don't have a favorite. Um, and here, one thing maybe we can draw relevance here is favoritism and, and a favorite ERP does not mean the best ERP. Likewise, a favorite football team does not mean the best football team. It's about finding, finding a, a match that's sometimes even outside of functionality, something that you can culturally align with, something that you can relate to, something that you can use within your organization. So, you know, Finding your favorite football team is very relevant in that regards to the to finding the right ERP. It might not be the the most popular, the highest sold. It might not have the the greatest user base, but it's it, it fits to your organization, your company, and you've built a relationship with it. And that's more far more important than having you know a Super Bowl champion, for example, in in your ERP quadrant. That's true, and I mean I can say that with the Denver Broncos, they may not be the most popular. Or great right now but you stay loyal as a fan if you're a i think fan. we're all i think we're all bronco <laughs> fans you know yes see. if i had to choose one <laughs> yeah there we go i don't know what do you think eric well what about i was going to ask maybe sort of a speed round uh session here uh, ad hoc speed round session if, if you were to look at different scenarios maybe that that'd be an easier way to pick a erp system you love the most so for example if if, if you were a um a small distribution company, you know, single site, fairly vanilla, 20, 30 employees, let's just say scenario wise, what, what would your favorite system or systems be the one that you would love the most for in that scenario? Yeah. In that case, I would base it on my growth projections and, and any complexities. Frankly, it, it, you know, one thing we look at it at, at that level, I would still ask the question, do I need ERP? Um, there's a lot of side solutions. There's a lot of bolt-ons to QuickBooks that can actually handle that scenario. Outside of that, I might start looking at the NetSuite, Acumatica, um, personally uh, Odoo, um, because it you know gives a little bit more flexibility in there to to modify it uh, to to grow an organization. But um, what about a you know mid-size? Let's call it a mid-size manufacturing distribution company. We've got a few locations, maybe in a couple different countries couple hundred employees, um, still growing fairly uh, steadily, but I've outgrown QuickBooks or I've outgrown my old legacy system. You know, what, what ERP system or systems do you love most in that case? Yeah, well, the international component throws throws a little bit in there. I'd, I'd start looking at a more stable manufacturing solution. I'd look at the lines for a, call it a more uh, legacy feel looking, you know, a robust system. I'd look at the Epicor's in for round. Um, you know, if you're looking, you know, NetSuite would certainly fit well in that. Uh, their their manufacturing end is growing pretty significantly, uh, and then on maybe a Microsoft, uh, due to the international component, um, the ability to you know replicate across 
regions if I'm looking at expansion, uh, M&A activity or anything like that. Yeah. And then how about a big multinational company with a few thousand employees? I've, I've, I've got a bunch of different systems in place. Um, I've grown through acquisition and I've got a hodgepodge of systems. Now I'm trying to consolidate, trying to standardize my operations. What are some of the best options that you might shortlist there? Yeah, so in this case, I know the, the, the go-to answer might be tier one. However, um, I would ask the question, what industry am I in right now? Um, and that's going to what's going to probably determine the the route. And, and the reason I ask that is there's some there's some platforms that can handle pretty significant scale, you know, multinational uh, in certain industries. Um, I'd look in you know like IFS we reference quite a bit, or um, you know D Dynamics is starting to show some capability in that round. And then Oracle SAP certainly fit that roadmap, but. Um, you want to look at, I think, the, the vertical focus and look at the also the vertical integration of activities. Um, so th there's a lot of questions that go into um, picking the right system. And a lot of, you know, you've got the, the name, the ERP name that might most relevantly fit a general scenario, but there could be some, some aspects to your business that could put you in a completely different situation. Yeah, makes sense. And then what about just in general CRM systems? Any, any favorites or ones that we see our clients choosing more often than others or loving more often than others? Well, yeah, I mean, so you, you look at Salesforce and they've got, the, call it the number one spot. They've got that Super Bowl win in, in a sense. Um, but with that comes complexity uh, and cost. So, you know, that I wouldn't say that's my favorite. Um, you look at some of the up and comers, you know, Zoho's pretty cool. You look at uh, like a HubSpot, um, you know, for a free application that builds into a marketing automation system, it's it's pretty clean. There's a lot of, on the CRM front, the, the trick is to understand how much CRM you really need. If you've got levels of, of compensation and variable commissions and, you know, multiple channels of, of sales, you're going to need something a little bit more robust on the Dynamics or Salesforce side. Um, if you've got a straightforward, you know, sales line and you're, you're selling a, a single product or service, then you can get something, you know, maybe a... a tier two off the shelf SaaS model that's a little bit easier to use and, and lower cost. Yeah. Good, good. Well, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I know you and I, Brian, and all of our team, really at the third stage, people ask us a lot, you know, what's, what's the best ERP system out there or what, what's your favorite ERP system? Almost like since we're independent, they're trying to, they're trying to bait us into saying there's, there's a best one or there's one that we love the most. And, and I think that's uh, where you and I are both pretty steadfast about there is no one best or favorite one out there. It just depends on the scenario and what the needs are. So I think, yeah, and to some people, the Cleveland Browns are the best. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, gotta, I think the Denver Broncos, I can't even say it. I was going to say, I, th I think they're the best, but I, I, can't, I can't lie on the show. <laughs> next year. Next <laughs> they're year. terrible. <laughs> they're just not good at all. <laughs> maybe next year. So uh, more importantly, or maybe just as importantly then, uh, have you planned anything out for Valentine's Day with, with your wife and family, Brian? <laughs> uh, I'm going to keep that on the down low. Got it. But yes, okay. we've got some plans with the still in semi quarantine here. It's a little bit more difficult, but we've we've got a fun evening planned. Good, good. I wish I could say the same. I should probably get on that. And, uh, <laughs> no, start. me too. Way to be ahead of the curve, friend. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Way to make us look bad. <laughs> Romantic at heart. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being on again, Brian. Really appreciate you having you on the show. Thanks for having me. You bet. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to be with Amanda Patton, and we're going to talk about uh, her experience and our team's experience helping a client through their early stages of transformation, and it's an e-commerce distribution company, so uh, it's a consumer product company. So it'll be a good discussion. We'll look forward to that, and we'll be right back after a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download Download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Now, 
Hello and welcome back to Transformation Ground Control podcast for digital and business transformation. I'm Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Parisa Noble. And just as a reminder, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can either subscribe to Third Stage's YouTube channel or Eric Kimberling's YouTube channel. We have two separate channels out there with lots of great content. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and, and LinkedIn and Facebook as well. And I'm excited to have our next guest on. It's a uh, senior consultant from our team. Her name is Amanda Patton. And before I introduce her or bring her onto the show, a fun little connection here with Valentine's Day, uh, Parisa, is that, I don't know if you know this or not, but over my right shoulder right here is a record cover that is called Third Stage. It's a, from the band Boston, which I know is way before your time, but I, I'm sure your, your parents or maybe your grandparents probably uh, listened to it you know, back in my day. Uh, that's that's the kind of stuff we were listening to. Um, you guys are listening to like all the pop and the top forty stuff now, but you know you kids today. But uh, us older folks were uh, us gray beards and old timers were listening to bands like Boston uh, back back in the day. And the reason I bring it up is our company. I named our company after that album behind me. And the first song on the album is called Amanda, which is you know one of the greatest uh, love songs, Valentine songs, whatever you want to call it. Uh, of the 80s. So it's a pretty interesting coincidence that our next guest on the show is Amanda Patton from uh, the Third Stage team. So it's only fitting that we would have an Amanda uh, on our team. So a little cool, cool connection there between Amanda and Boston Third Stage. Oh, I love that. I got to listen to that song. Maybe that'll be our theme song this Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great song. It's a, It was really popular when I was in I think I was in eighth grade and interestingly enough, I had a girlfriend, my first girlfriend was in eighth grade and her name was Amanda and that song came out. It just kind of, it all, it only made sense that it all somehow ties back to third stage and this company. Uh, it's a stretch, but you know, it, it works for it's me. meant to be. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it works. <laughs> right. So, so Amanda, someone, uh, we, myself and others on the team have known for several years, actually, she's been in the industry for a long time, even before she, she crossed over into the independent consulting space. She's worked at software vendors and, done a lot of project management and now done quite a bit of consulting, a lot of different projects for our team. And we're going to dive into a case study of a project that she's working on today. So without further ado, uh, Amanda, welcome to the show. Eric, thanks for having me. Sure. So we, uh, before we get into this software evaluation, software selection case study, I just want to talk a little bit about your background and your career journey and the transition you've made recently from working with software vendors in the past and now becoming a consultant at third stage. And you, I know you joined the company last year. So how has that transition been? And I, and I want to talk about it in the context, especially as we get into this discussion around software evaluation, but you, you have a pretty unique perspective having been on the vendor side. Um, what, how has that transition gone? And what are some of your observations being a consultant working for third stage, being independent and agnostic versus working for the software vendors? Uh, good question. It's definitely different. Um, it's a much broader perspective on this side, I will say. Uh, coming from the, the vendor perspective, we were looking uh, at a, sp a specific you know, set of functionality and, and what it is that we can do and kind of looking at it through that lens. And it was rather limited, I suppose. And then when you come to this side, you really, my, my view is expanded uh, because I'm not tied to any particular technology. I'm not really looking at it through the lens of the solution. I'm more looking at it from, you know, what does the client need? What is the outcome we're trying to get to? And taking in a lot of different factors. Um, a lot of the technologies um, can do a lot of the same things, but there are more important factors, kind of a bigger picture view. So I think that's the main difference is uh, instead of knowing everything about one solution, you need to know a little bit about all the solutions and most importantly, really get to the bottom of what the client's trying to achieve in the end. Yeah, coming at it from a different perspective and uh, you probably have a unique, I would imagine you have a pretty unique understanding of how software vendors work and how they try to sell their software versus what the client may or may not need. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Well, good. I think it's easy to see that. I, I have I have sympathy for what they're going through and the job they've been tasked with, but also, um, you know, having the ability to kind of see through some of the sales tactics and really get down to uh, the functionality and what the customer's after. So, yeah, you, you, you're, uh, you're onto them. You understand the head games they're playing in, in the sales process. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, so I know since you've joined third stage, uh, you've, you've been involved with a number of different types of projects, including a number of uh, software evaluations and selections. And so today, we wanted to talk 
in particular about one that you're working on right now. You're sort of right in the thick of it. You just finished demos last week from what I understand. And you're sort of, you know, haven't reached a decision yet or made the, we haven't made the final recommendation to this client yet, but I thought it'd be a good to, time to have the discussion of kind of what are you seeing and, and what are you experiencing? But before we dive into some of those details, maybe give us just a little bit of background. I, you know, we can't reveal the name of the client for confidentiality reasons, but what are, how would you describe the client at a high level as far as what they do, how many employees they have? Just give us some general context here. Sure. So they are a relatively new company and growing quite, quite rapidly um, and uh, have un under 100 employees. And I would call them an e-commerce platform distribution company. Uh, in terms of, you know, what it is that they do and, and bring to the market. And so, you know, with that being a relatively new company, I think their perspective is a little different than some of the other clients uh, that I'm used to working with. So I, um, you know, looking at their tremendous growth and looking at the ability to ability to scale, uh, but also stay unique and stay, you know, in the core competencies and the things that make them unique in the marketplace. That's a, that's a tough balance uh, as you start to get bigger. So um, one of the things that they said early on was that they were, they were growing up. Uh, and so part of that is that your technology has to also grow up with you. So that's the challenge. Yeah. So what is the, what, what is it that makes them unique in terms of you know, their business model and, or, or the organization itself. Um, how would you describe that? I mean, they are very modern um, and open-minded and uh, tech savvy and kind of have this do-it-yourself mentality and of wanting to, you know, build and have creative latitude and, and have the autonomy to create technology that reflects their process, reflects their customer, reflects their market. And, even COVID recently, you know, as a, as an example, having to pivot and having the ability to then turn around and, and make updates and customizations and, and alterations to their homegrown um, application that they use, right? Because they own it and they built it. And so that's a quick and easy thing to do. And that's not always the case, right? If you are on someone else's technology. I think too that, um, they are very engaged and very creative. And so a lot of times companies, you know, have done things a certain way for a really long time or the technology, you just kind of expect this is what the technology is going to look like. We're going to have to sort of, you know, fit ourselves into that. And that's not really their perspective. Uh, they're very unique and very nuanced in what they bring to the market, the way they, uh, the way they service their customers. And so, uh, there's a lot of there are a lot of challenges because it doesn't necessarily fit into you know the box or the process as as we say, but um, also a lot of great opportunities to learn, to be creative, and to try new things. Right. So, and I actually want to come back to some follow up questions on on that point about their unique culture and and the unique operations and, and even some of the um, current systems that they have in place that are currently being strained as as they grow. But we'll come back to that, but. Before I get to that, what maybe just to back up a little bit, what what is the scope or what is our role uh, on this project working with this client? Our role is to help them evaluate technology that would help their business to become more efficient and to scale with their growth. Um, they had you know forex growth in 2018, just like I said, growing really really fast, um, and to help them look at their process, right? So that's a separate thing of, you know, workshops, really talking through what does your process look like now? Um, what is it going to look like in the future? What changes could you be making to make those more efficient, streamline some of that uh, from a process perspective? And then, you know, how does that marry up to the technology you're currently using and the, the technology that you're, you know, evaluating? So our job is to help them really just take a big picture view of everything, right? The process, the technology that's available, and also really listening to what it is that they want. Uh, like I said, they aren't traditional. It's not like they've had the same system in place for 20 years and now they're looking to swap it out for a different system. This is um, a young, creative, tech-savvy company who's built their own technology. And so they want to have um, autonomy to a point and the ability to continue to have some control over over their technology that they know that they need 
the structure of an ERP system, a uh, single source of truth, if you will, in place, if they are going to continue to keep up with their growth and um, market share. Right. That's interesting. So with this homegrown mentality and the ownership of the technology they have now, what have some of the challenges been in terms of either you know, outgrowing the system or, or facing limitations? What are some of those, those challenges that we've observed in our assessment of them so far? So I would say the amount of manual work, you know, probably out of the gate, that's the main pain point is when you're small and you're just starting out, it, that's fine, but they've grown so quickly and um, to, to be able to keep up with that growth, they, they've had to really work harder and harder and harder to maintain it and to expand it and to make sure that it can keep up with, you know, what they needed to keep up with. They're having a really hard time um, synthesizing all the data. There's, there's push and pull and data coming in from, you know, all kinds of different tools and having data isn't really that useful if it, if it can't tell you the story that, that you need to know to make business decisions. And so that's certainly um, one of the big challenges. There are a lot of complexities around managing 3PL. Uh, we hear that a lot. And so just getting the logistics and how you work with that, how you pull, push and pull the data uh, in a way that helps you to have you know accurate information. And like I said, real-time data that you can make decisions off of, um, not having to spend two weeks pulling reports and running Excel and doing workarounds and all those kinds of things. So, and then customer happiness, right? The ability to look into a system and say, here's where your order is. This is why it's delayed. You know, having really good information because they're extremely customer centric and they want to make sure that they have real time information and that they're keeping their customers happy. Um, and then, you know, just continuing to see the, the growth has been monumental and they know they have right so what what is it that in the market or if and i don't know if you know the answer to this question but what is driving their growth what's, what's fueling that that forex growth that they experienced last year is it it's, it's just lack of competition in their in their niche or something they're doing differently that's, that's fueling that growth i think i think it's a combination of factors um you know as some of the order and old ways of, of shopping and and doing um, doing business have changed you know people are more likely to to go online and to get really good information and if you're used to dealing with Amazon or you know the like um, it's you can have something to your house the next day you can have you know where it is you know when it's going to be there you can be competitive from a pricing perspective um, so the way we shop at People as a nation, you know, has changed a lot, and so that has fed into their success and their um, ability to pull together just tons of information and really curate a process and a, a an experience really for the customer, so that you don't have to spend so much time looking at seventeen different websites or you know uh, product reviews and all these different things. It's it's all pulled together to make the shopping experience better for the customer. Um, and I think, you know, to be able to do that and then to have all the news and all the information there in one place is just one of the reasons. And then, of course, with COVID, um, which has happened to companies, the online shopping is, is pretty much how we live now um, for the most part, right? And so a lot of traffic who would have preferred to go to a brick and mortar to do some of this is, are going to be are going to be online. So that's another reason. Um, and I will say some of the, the brick and mortar um stores where some of their uh, products would be you know have, have gone away or they are going away and um, they're being kind of absorbed into into a different model and so all of that has led to their ability to grow right yeah and it's it's interesting to hear you describe this growth and the evolution and the fast evolution of this company and uh, on one hand, that requires a certain amount of flexibility and entrepreneurial spirit and, and uh, adaptability. But then on the other hand, you also mentioned that they want to add structure and they want to um, use technology to help standardize or, or structure some of their their uh, business different. So uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when I, we come back, I want to ask you some more questions around that and just uh, what we're seeing in particular with 
the different types of technologies we're evaluating for them right now and where some of the um, strengths and weaknesses are. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. And I'm here with Amanda Patton. We'll be right back. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Amanda, welcome back. We're talking about, before the break, the software evaluation we're going through with this client and some of the unique challenges that they're trying to address as a result of their transformation. They've gone through quite a bit of growth and they're an entrepreneurial company, very customer centric. And at the same time, they're trying to introduce technology to provide some structure and an ability to scale. So with all that being said, and that sort of high level current state assessment, where did we land in our shortlist? What, what sort of shortlist do we recommend uh, to the client and where are we at in the process? So we just wrapped up demos last week and I'll, I'll just kind of start by saying this was different as I've alluded to earlier in the conversation, they are unique. And um, the reason for that is that they have grown a lot of technology, you know, on their own. And a lot of that works for them. And then they're starting as grown, uh, starting to notice some limitations and um, asking questions like, how sustainable is this? How long can we continue to do this? That kind of thing. It's becoming more of a heavy lift for the, uh, the tech team. And so our short list had a mixture of what we would consider, you know, more kind of more traditional core ERP, um, like Sage Act and that's sweet. And then a couple of open source options too. We wanted to look at Odoo and ERP next and try to understand on the spectrum, um, you know, solutions that would offer structure and the single source of truth that you're going to get out of an ERP system with some autonomy and the option if you want your tech team uh, to continue to be able to kind of build some of that out and do some of those customizations. So the before that we kind of landed on from a from a shortlist perspective, and we did want a mixture of different options. So we could really delve into what that was going to look like for them. Yeah, it almost seems like hearing you talk, it almost seems like there's a decision to be made around you know how much do we want to push or change the the culture and the operations, um, you know, with the open source options with Modu and ERP Next. Obviously, that's going to be more aligned with a more flexible model and. X3 and especially NetSuite is going to be more structural and more if you're moving more towards a standard a standard model. Has that been a key discussion point or has that been a consideration in the evaluation so far? It is a huge discussion point, one that has been going on since the very beginning and continues uh, to this day and, and will, I, I'm sure. And a lot more clarity has been uncovered as we've continued workshops and discussions and, you know, looked at the pros and cons on, on both sides. And uh, we actually called it, a, we've been calling it a strategic fork in the road because regardless of what system you select and implement, there are some strategy decisions to be made um, within the company. And so those are some, some tough questions where, you know, you have to look at the strategy, the culture, the future, the growth, and all of the uh, different things. And in some cases, it may be worth making a change to process. Um, and other times, you know, some of the pain points could be addressed by one of these systems. Some of the pain points are not going to be addressed by any technology, right? It's a people situation. It's a process situation. So really taking the time to have conversations and, and workshops and make sure we're engaging everyone um, across different functional areas, across um, different, you know, roles and levels of the organization just to make sure that there's a lens for every part of the business that we're not just looking at it, you know, from a technical standpoint or a people standpoint or a process standpoint. 
And right. that really is uh, one of the biggest challenges is the, you know, the strategic fork in the road. There are some big decisions to be made. Uh, the client has made quite a few that have helped um, kind of narrow the path and help us understand what it is they're really trying to get to. But there's still some work to be done in that, in that regard. Hmm. Interesting. So I get, there's two different directions. Speaking of fork in the road, there's two different paths I could take the, the next question, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with the, maybe the technology itself and come back to the organizational piece of it. But on the pure technology side, um, what, given the short list that you guys have, the fact that you just had demos last week, what are some of the general observations you have as it relates to this client and, and how those different systems compare to one another? So the demos ended up being X3 and NetSuite. And, um, you know, Odoo did really well in the RFP analysis, but didn't make it to demo because we were kind of having conversations about the structure that needs to be in place and not having so much onus on the product engineering team um, as they move forward and continue to grow and, and the need to grow. Because what that means is you're going to have to keep hiring and adding to that infrastructure to be able to support that. Um, and as we took a closer look, we, we um, while Odoo is an, an incredible solution and we found a lot of really great, valuable things about it, um, some of the internal discussions within the client sort of kind of pulled us in a different direction. So because of those dis discussions and, and workshops and such, we ended up with X3 and NetSuite. And getting to see the demonstrations from each of them really, um, gave the client uh, kind of more options, right? Trying to understand, you know, if, if there's a, a scale or a spectrum, there was, you know, ERP next and Odoo and then and then X3, and then we kind of get over to NetSuite in terms of the, um, I don't think rigidity is the right word, but, you know, it's a structure, right? It's, it's there and this is sort of, this is kind of what it is um, and, Great demonstration, great functionality. Uh, we know, you know, plenty of clients who who use NetSuite. But in the case of this this uh, client, you know, the ability to take those applications and customize them. So it's adding two things of yes, we have a single source of truth. We have the you know all the functionality you would expect out of the box from an ERP system, but we also have the flexibility to uh, make changes, customization. And so if we need to pivot quickly due to the market, the customer, the just whatever is going on, they are able to do that internally without going back to code and having to go through bringing in additional consultants or, you know, some of those kinds of things. So I think that the ability to be more, we saw a little bit more of that with, with X3. Um, and then, of course, there are conversations about, um, you know, all the integrations and what does that look like? And how does each vendor, you know, work with those kinds of things? And at the end of the day, is it, what is it going to look like in the day of life of the people who work for this company? Um, you know, walk me through this scenario. And that's what a lot of the demonstrations were. A lot of very unique and nuanced scenarios that had to be uh, addressed. And so, you know, in my estimation, um, X3 had a little more flexibility from that perspective. Right. Uh, but both did great. Both did great demonstrations and have great. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like when, uh, you know, you look at, you did a good job describing that spectrum or the continuum that, you know, Odoo and ERP Next have over on the, the flexible open source side. And then NetSuite's kind of the other extreme with the more standard, you know, mature processes and that sort of thing. And, you know, the interesting thing about that is no matter which direction they go, it sounds like you know, they may end up somewhere in the middle, but if you go to either extreme there, there's going to be some sort of trade-off. Either you're going to own, the onus is going to be on your IT department to own and and maintain the technology more than you might with a NetSuite. Or if you go with a NetSuite, that's going to put more of an organizational impact uh, or put more pressure on organizational change management with those standardized processes, especially given their entrepreneurial nature. Entrepreneurial nature. Yes, definitely. And I think that the trade-off is the, losing some autonomy for some more of the structure uh, so that we've got these repeatable processes and the single source of truth and this, you know, data that's going to start to really tell a story over time and, and that. So then that was another, uh, you know, part of the internal conversations that needed to happen. Of, um, 
with control over the technology, it's also work for your team. And how much work do you want to have and for how long? And is it scalable with the growth that you're experiencing? Um, at some point, that's gonna, that economy, that's not gonna probably make a whole lot of sense in the long run, so. Right. Yeah. So I think you've touched on this a little bit, but maybe dig in, if we can dig in a little bit more. When you think about change management and how this project and this overall implementation or transformation will affect this client. And I, and I know we don't know the technology yet. We don't know, you know, we haven't made a formal recommendation yet. They haven't made a decision, but in general, what do you, th- what would you anticipate the change management challenges being some of the biggest change management issues or challenges that this particular client will, will need to face? I, I will say that this client has been really engaged uh, really engaged, really excited, you know, a lot of input. And so that is really good from an OCM perspective. That's a really good place to be where you've got a lot of, you know, engagement. So they started off on a, on a really strong, um, uh, you know, from, from that perspective, really strong. But I would say too, that because this is a newer company and you have a lot of people who the demographic of this company is used to very, you know, new, modern, um, technology, as opposed to um, some of us who, you know, maybe are used to more traditional technologies. And um, right. I think that's a part of it too. Is if if the employees of a client have been through ERP, um, you know, implementations before, or they're accustomed to those types of technologies, this isn't a new language. But if you're coming from a world where you haven't worked with that or you haven't been through a selection and implementation before, a lot of the terminology and the process and a lot of it would would seem foreign. Um, And it may be even a little uh, corporate or, you know, uh, restraining or, or, you know, that kind of thing. So that to me will be one of the biggest challenges is to understand that this is to help, um, you know, stabilize and um, kind of mature their process as a company too. And, you know, they said it themselves, they, they're growing up, right? Um, and so part of that is kind of making sure that you have the technology in place to, to support what you're doing now and what you're going to be doing in the future. And um, I would say too, training, uh, just making sure that that that's being communicated and that people are being offered training um, and the rationale behind the training too, right? This is a very creative, technically savvy, curious group of people, and they want to understand the why and what's the impact and, you know, all of those types of things. So explaining the big picture instead of, you know, just do this because like, like you find in some corporate environments, more of a conversation, pulling people in and getting buy-in and keeping them excited out. Um, at the end of the day, this is going to make your life easier. It may not seem like it now, but but that is, you know, that is the goal. It's also going to position the company for, you know, long-term success uh, in the market. But I think getting over the, um, you know, it's, it's the technology they use now is, is fun and exciting. And it's like all the shiny things, you know, in the tech world. Uh, versus kind of getting into something that's a little more mature, a little more, um, you know, predictable. And so I think that will be, that will be the big bridge. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're kind of underscoring a, a really important point about software evaluation in general for, for organizations is that there's no one size fits all answer in this client has such a unique culture, a unique business model, uh, so much different than other clients of ours, for example, that are manufacturing companies that have been around for a hundred years and they're pretty well established processes. It's just, you know, two very different worlds and two very different evaluations and outcomes you're going to get, um, which I find really interesting. It's fun. Yeah. It's so to, to summarize then, if, if I'm a organization that's thinking about a digital transformation or thinking about new technology or software for my business, what are some of the biggest points of uh, or the biggest recommendations, the most important recommendations you might make to me as a, as a company that's about to start this sort of journey? Well, I think one of the things is to start with the foundation, you know, to really, and it, I think a lot of times this can be, this process gets overwhelming and complicated really quickly. Um, you start doing research and you're watching videos and you're comparing things and it gets, 
it gets a little uh, overwhelming and people get out ahead of themselves, I think, sometimes. And so for me, it's to start with the foundation of like what defines success. You know, what is it that we're trying to achieve? And getting on the same page about that. Um, and also asking is what we're doing now sustainable? You know, is, is what we're doing working? Um, you know, are we being reactive or proactive to the market and the changes? And I think a lot of companies have had this demonstrated for them or, you know, some good, some bad on how they pivoted and how they were able to react and, and what um, this kind of like with COVID, how, you know, what that brought in and what it exposed. And in the long run, it will probably be a really good thing, uh, even though a little bit painful sometimes. I think also making sure that you're kind of demystifying, decomplicating uh, the process, right? And just getting down to facts of, you know, what it is that we're trying to achieve. Um, and then taking things, my, my final advice would just be to phase, you know, take things in, in uh, small bites, <laughs> you know, and, and we talk about this all the time at third stage, but really looking at the process in the current state and making sure that you have a really good, healthy understanding of what that is and knowing that no technology is going to come in and magically fix things, um, that it'll be a joint effort from, from you know, the technology side, process, and the people. Um, and I do have one more thing that kind of pops up is that the subject matter experts need access to the, to the process, right? The buy-in, the opinions, the day in the life, and really understanding what it looks like. Uh, because if you're an executive, you may just see, you know, the reports and you may be a sliver of it. But when you talk to some of the, the subject matter expert, experts and the functional area owners, um, the, the inefficiencies that are happening in the company um, due to kind of the process and the technology challenges um, would would make you know an executive's head spin if they really knew some of the inefficiencies and you know the time suck and the frustration and, and maybe some of the inaccuracies and things like that. Um, so that was kind of a long list, but that's those are the things that kind of stand out to me. Yeah, you, you cover the whole spectrum there, from strategy down to you know the subject matter experts and kind of what's happening on the front lines there. And I think that's a, you know, a good reminder for executives that might be listening that this isn't just a, a real simple technology replacement. This is you know, messing with people's lives, with their jobs, with the way you do business, the way you interact with your customers, all that stuff's going to be impacted. So, well, good. Well, I appreciate you being on the show here, Amanda. I really appreciate the, the time you spent here today. Yeah, that was fun. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. So we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Okay, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. I'm here with Parisa Noble. We just had an interesting case study with Amanda Patton from our team. Uh, Parisa, what were your, some of your observations or thoughts on that conversation? Yeah, well, I think it's important to note where we're at in the e-commerce world, right? I mean, this client is going through massive growth. Um, they're scaling and that's why they brought you guys in. That's why they're doing a digital transformation. And I feel like anybody, any company that's touching the e-commerce space right now is probably going through a similar situation where they're seeing a lot of growth given the circumstances of, you know, COVID and everything going online. So I'm, I'm interested. I, I kind of, you know, started looking up 
what is the risk of scaling too quickly? You know, because if you're going from zero to 100 within a year's time span, I mean, there's a lot of companies who kind of break during that time due to the challenges that they see during scaling. So um, I looked up, I found a... Um, an article on entrepreneur.com that talked about the seven challenges of scaling your company too quick. So the first one is scaling before the perfect product market fit. The second is choosing the wrong people to work with. The third is focusing on sales and marketing rather than building a long-term demand. So you want to keep your customers sticky and build on it, not have people go in one door out the other. Um, competing on price, so undercutting your competitors not changing management structures as a, as you grow, um, ignoring issues that pop up and forgetting to trim the fat um, as you scale. So my question to you, Eric, is how does the digital transformation or implementing a new ERP system to help streamline these things, how does it alleviate some of those challenges? Yeah, well, I think first of all, you know, you bring up a good point about the last point about stickiness and, and just the overall customer stickiness. And, and if you back up even more and look at what does it take to scale a company today in today's environment, it's almost like more companies need to think like retailers or consumer product companies, kind of like the case study we talked about with Amanda. You know, they are, they're directly in the consumer product space, um, selling directly to consumers. So e-commerce makes sense to them. And that, that whole concept of customer experience has always been fairly important in the retail space. But now I think more companies that aren't in the retail space, they're in other other industries, even, you know, a company that sells B2B or an industrial manufacturer distribution company, they have to start thinking more like a retailer in the overall customer experience, partly because with COVID, you know, you're having less face-to-face -face customer interaction and that stickiness that you're talking about is, is harder to create with the old school, you know, human interaction uh, way of doing things. Um, so, you know, new technology can help on that front to help not just do sales and marketing to, to your point about that not being enough. You have to create that stickiness. Um, but then, you know, when you talk about trimming the fat, you know, that being one of the scalability challenges, that's often a symptom of not even realizing that you have all that fat to cut. You know, you, you may not have enough analytics or data or just understanding of your business, which could be related to technology. It could also be behavioral or lack of focus. But technology can help provide better information to help you realize that and help make those sorts of decisions. So I think that's where, you know, you really have to look is just, you know, kind of what are you trying to accomplish with your growth and how can technology better help that, but also how's the world around us changing and forcing us to think more about customer experience, like I mentioned, or even employee experience, you know, with, with uh, you know, attrition and turmoil in the job markets and, you know, people worrying about their health and, remote work and safety at work, all that stuff. Now you have to think more than ever about employee experience. And that's something that technology can help with. It's not the only answer, but it is a, you know, it certainly is an enabler of, of what, how you can address those several things that you mentioned. Right. For sure. And I think, you know, obviously as you grow, there's going to be a light that's shined on things that aren't working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, you know, what are the issues that keep popping up if you brush them under the rug and say, oh, you know, that's not a huge deal. Those things will compound. And I feel like if you implement the right ERP solution or the right CRM, et cetera, that's what's going to help you streamline those things and kind of breeze through it rather than kind of going on a bumpy road, if that makes sense. Yeah, just going with the status quo or just keep heading in the direction you're going. You've got to look at, you know, where do we pivot and where, where can we use technology and business process improvements, organizational improvements strategically to help help us get there. Right. Right. And then another thing too, so it sounds like Amanda and her team are coming in to specifically help this organization dial in on what software would work for them. So helping them understand where they're at, where they're going and, you know, which ERP system would make sense. So they came down to a short list. She mentioned that they just did their demos. So I'm curious about the demoing process. So when you bring in uh, these companies, you know, like say you have Sage X3 come in and do a demo. What does that process look like? And can a company really grasp what that platform can do for them in like a one hour demo, if it even is one hour? Just walk me through that whole thing. I'm curious. Sure. So generally what we'll do in the, the evaluation process is the first thing is just fully understand 
the company's operations, not not only how they're operating today, but also what they're doing well and what those pain points are within of within the world they operate today. But even more importantly, what could they be doing better in the future? So where are those pain points? Where are the bottlenecks? Where are those you know customer experience shortcomings or uh, internal silos? You know those are the types of things you're looking at. How can what are the things we want to address or fix or improve with new technology? So we define that stuff up front and define what their future state processes and requirements uh, should be at, at a high level. We're not getting down into a ton of detail as far as how, you know, how we're going to press certain buttons to do certain things. But just in general, this is how information flows and how we make decisions and how we interact with our customers or, or how we want to interact with our customers. And once you've done all that, then you can say, okay, when we evaluate software vendors, we're going to do it in the context of who we are, not just have them come in and do a sales pitch. So we'll generally do sort of a day in the life scripted demo process where Sage X3 or whoever the software vendors are, NetSuite, Oracle, SAP, they'll come in and they'll, um, you know, they, they typically will try to do their normal sales pitch, but we try to, you know, part of the value of having us as consultants is that we try to uh, sort of box them in into, and keep them focused on what the business needs are, not just what the shiny bells and whistles of the software are, which aren't always relevant. A lot of times they're totally irrelevant to what the client needs are. So that scripted demo process is probably the, the best way. It's not the only way. There's a lot of other data points that we draw from when we're helping a client make that decision. But seeing it and getting a feel for how the technology works you know, can usually be done. We, we typically spend about a day on each software vendor, so it's, it's more than an hour for sure. You know, but you would break it up into different parts of your business and have them show different parts of their technology as it relates uh, to their business there. I see. Yeah. And something Amanda mentioned too, as just as she summarized her best practices is uh, she called it a day in the life. So having executives bring in people from the front line who are actually going to be working on the software and, you know, have the insights of how things are working um, on the ground level. Do you see companies bring in people on the front lines enough, or is that something that's sometimes overlooked and still kept to the project team or the executives? Yeah, it's a mix. I mean, we see it. Uh, some clients are better at it than others. Um, you know, it's a tough balancing act because on one hand, you want to involve as many people as possible and make them part of the process. And then they have ownership and buy-in into what the ultimate decision or recommendation ends up being. But on the other hand, you can't have, you know, everyone in the company partake. So, uh, you know, there's ways around that. There's ways that you can you can have more people involved, but in a way that's not disruptive to the day to day business. So it's a fine balancing act. Uh, and that's what that balancing act is where a lot of companies struggle. But I think in general, you know, most companies are pretty good at involving the right people. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, making sure you, you've thought through who all the stakeholders are and who all the key influencers within the company are and all the people that know best, you know, how the strength or what the strengths are today versus what we could be doing better with new technology in the future. Right. That makes sense. Well, I'm excited to see what this client does uh, with this new technology. Yeah, they're, they're a fun client to work with. I know our team loves working with them. They've got a really unique product and platform that they uh, work from. And uh, it's, it's always interesting, you know, working in different industries like this, you know, as we talk about we talk a lot about e-commerce in this case study, but it's interesting how something like e-commerce in this case is a, you know, business to, a business to consumer distribution type situation where e-commerce is obviously very important, but, but you get a lot of lessons and things that apply to other types of companies too. So, you know, that's where, you know, a man, an old school manufacturing distribution company, for example, um, could learn a lot from a company like this one that's relatively new. It's a young company. It's growing quickly, very focused on the customer experience and e-commerce. You could take a lot of those lessons and apply them to, uh, you know, call it an old school legacy industry as well. So that, that's what makes consulting fun is being able to cross-pollinate lessons across industries like that. It's all so relevant. That's the truth. It, it is. It'd be interesting to see see what they do. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back with our next guest, who is Marcus Harris. And he's, he's an attorney that's been on our show before. And we're going to talk about lessons from transformation failures and some of the pitfalls that you can be uh, avoiding. So be sure to uh, join us for that. We'll be right back after a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. 
Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello and welcome to Transformation Ground Control Podcast. I'm here with Parisa Noble. Uh, you can listen to us on YouTube every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, U.S. Time, 3 p.m. London Time, or 11 p.m. Hong Kong Time. You can also find us after that time every week on Google, Apple, Spotify, Pandora, whatever your podcast platform of choice is. So thanks for thanks for listening or watching in. Uh, our next guest I'm excited for, it's Marcus Harris, and we actually had him on our first episode episode one of Transformation Ground Control. And in that episode, if you haven't watched it or listened to it, if you go back and listen, it's a really interesting conversation um, where we talk about contract negotiations. And this is a topic that we're going to talk about today that has the risk of being a, a sort of a buzzkill, if you will. It's a, we're, we're talking about transformation failures. And on the surface, that sounds scary and something we may not want to talk about, but there's a lot of great lessons we we get from some of these failures, especially when you look at it from an attorney's perspective, you know, someone who's trained to think about risk and mitigating risk and uh, in some cases assigning blame, you know, when something goes wrong or, or, you know, making allegations in that, in that way. And so Marcus is someone I've worked with over the years as an expert witness. I've been an expert witness on a few of his cases, and I certainly have my own opinions on what causes failures and, you know, have opined on that in, in cases, but Today, we want to get an attorney's perspective, get his perspective on not only why these projects fail, but most importantly, what could companies be doing differently and be doing better to hedge against the risk of failure, or at least to mitigate uh, some of those risks, uh, not just from a legal perspective, but also just from an organizational uh, project management perspective, too. He's got a really good handle on uh, things even outside the legal realm of, of what causes some of these failures. So excited to have Marcus on the show. Uh, Marcus, thanks for joining today. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Eric. Thank you, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, Marcus, you and I have worked together on on a few different failures and lawsuits in the past, and I've been an expert witness for some of your cases. But I always get involved a bit later in the process uh, after legal action has been filed. Whereas you're you're kind of on the front line when the initial contact is made or the initial discussion about a potential lawsuit is happening. So, I guess my question for you to start is: How does just in general, generally speaking, across all the cases you've worked on? What is it that happens during implementations in general that, that leads to lawsuit? Or in other words, how does it get that bad uh, to, to get to the point where they need to call you and, and initiate some sort of legal action? Yeah, well, you know, the simple answer is it's got to get real bad, right? I mean, I think every implementation that, that I've been associated with, certainly from a legal side, but you know, we come in, in in other capacities sometimes as well, um, it's certainly in my former life being in house, uh, you know, they're they're almost all difficult, um, and I think very rarely do they go as planned, as expected. It's likely that they're going to come in you know, over budget, um, exceed whatever kind of time estimate that was initially projected. So I think it goes without saying that they're difficult. Um, you know, w- when they come to me as clients, it's it's because you know the the vendor has repeatedly said to them. I can get the software to work. If you give me more money. If you give me more time, above all, give me more patience. It's going to do what we said it was going to do. You just need to be fully invested in this. And I think there's some truth to that, and I'll, I'll get into that more in a second. But it's it's usually just an exasperated call saying we are just at our wit's end. We have spent millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars over budget. And it just doesn't look like there's an end in sight. You know, a lot of times they will have a, a, some kind of a third party consultant or some kind of third party expert come in to just verify what was done. Kind of, it's not really a post mortem, but you know, just verify, you know, how far off are, 
is the vendor really getting this thing to work? Um, other times they'll bring in a specialty consulting firm that is, is supposed to right side a project. And in connection with that right siding, that consultant will also have done some sort of analysis. And that usually is kind of the impetus um, for a phone call to me. There's got to be some kind of either just you know throw your hands up after just being, you know, spending money excessively milked by the vendor, um, or you know, you've wisened up, you've stopped the implementation, and you have somebody else come in and give you essentially an independent verification that something was wrong. And that's usually when we would call. And you know, I think my, my first response in almost every situation is, have you done everything that you can do to get this software to where you think it needs to be so that you can work with this software? And if the answer is, is yes, then I say, okay, let's, let's think about your legal options. But I, I think you've got to, you've got to really make sure, you know, that, that what you've gone through is bad enough to start, start a lawsuit. Cause it's not, it's not an easy road to go down either. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like, uh, it, it seems like companies get in so far over their heads and they keep doubling down trying to fix things. And at some point they reach that tipping point where, Hey, despite the pain of a lawsuit or filing legal action, that's going to be our best path forward, which I'm sure is a tough decision for a lot of companies to make. Yeah, no, I think it's an incredibly tough decision. You know, the, the cost outlay that you're looking at in a, in a ERP lawsuit in particular, you know, and, and make no mistake about it, this is complex commercial litigation. This is not, you know, something like a slip and fall where there's a finite uh, moment and there's witnesses and there's you know, easily obtainable evidence. I mean, this is sometimes, you know, months, years of an implementation process and a sales process and, and for that an evaluation process. All of that's going to be gone through in extreme detail by a number of lawyers looking for you know, what we call hot documents and, and documents that evidence you know, where this thing went off the rails and whose fault it was. So the cost associated with something is just enormous. And, and, you know, it, it, it has to make sense financially, you know, and, and for it to make sense financially, you, you, you as the customer have to have been damaged pretty badly. And, it, and it, it's exponential to some extent. I think when you're looking at a damages analysis from a, an ERP failure, you're not just looking at the cost that you spent on failed software that's unusable. No, it's, it's where you would be today had that software actually worked, had it done what it was supposed to have. It's all the time, expense, and effort that your team put into it. It's all the hardware that you bought, all the third-party software that you purchased. You know, and now, because you're 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 going to walk away from it, you've got to do it all over again. And and the goal of any any of a lawsuit like this is to to cover as much of that as we can to get that customer whole. Right, right. And you know whether or not they're, they're able to recover or be happy with those results is is a I assume a different a whole other story. Y yeah, and, and you know that that's that's one of the, the most important questions when you're deciding whether, you know, to, to move forward after a failure, um, you know, a lawsuit is, well, what, what does success look like to you? How do you define an, a successful outcome? For some people, that's just, we're going to go guns blazing. We're going to be aggressive. We're going to take this to a jury trial and make them feel as much pain as possible. That typically is not a rational way to go. And I think, you know, if, if you're, Thinking that way as a customer, it's been wrong. You need to take a step back and look at this from a logical, rational business perspective. Now, what's the cost benefit analysis? How much is it going to cost? What's the likely outcome from a dollar perspective? What are you going to get out of this? And does it make sense to, to, to put that cash outlay on attorney's fees, you know, given the likely, likelihood of whatever outcome you, you deem to be successful? Right, right. So when you're looking at these lawsuits and, and I've worked with you on a number of these, like I said, where, where you go into these cases and you see just a, a whole host of problems. I mean, you've got, it's usually not just one thing or one problem. It's, it's just a mess of stuff happening. But when you really peel back the onion and get to the, the root cause of it, it, a lot of times it comes down to a handful of things that are causing all the other symptoms or problems. 
But if you had to summarize some of the cases you've been involved with over the years, I mean, what are those most common things that come to mind that are the, those common root causes for all the other pain that they might be feeling throughout the transformation? Yeah, you know, it, 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 this is kind of a mantra that I, that I repeat. And I know we had another uh, podcast and, and brought this concept up last time, and, and I'll bring it up again. And, and you know, it, these things fail usually not because of a technology issue. It's, 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 you know, generally the, the software works. Now, it may not work for you. It may not work as represented. It may not work in your environment, but that software company is going to be able to trot out hundreds of thousands of customers around the world that have used that software successfully. And that is you know, a challenging thing to overcome in a lawsuit. But you know, the question is, you know, what, what do we see? What, what leads to failure? What are the common themes? And I think fundamentally, like I said the day when we had it, an interview, is it's almost always a people issue. Okay? It's a failure to manage the process properly. And you know, there's a variety of reasons for that. And I think we can mitigate that through uh, you know, proper contract negotiation and documenting what's supposed to happen, milestones, deadlines, change orders, and that kind of thing. And that's certainly important. But there's always these, these conflicting uh, motives, right, that, that just naturally come into play. And I think you know, as, as a customer, you want this thing implemented it's, cheaply as possible, as fast as possible, and you want to get the most out of it that you possibly can. You know, the, the vendor's goal is, is really kind of the polar opposite of that. And that's, you know, let's, let's get in there. Um, let's do a lot of customizations, modifications. Let's make this thing sing for this customer. And that's all fine and good, but the problem with that is they're incented by the number of hours that they work number of modifications, the number of customizations that we do, and above all, really, you know, how long this project takes, you know, I mean, if the longer the better to some extent. I don't want to paint all vendors with the same brush, certainly not all of them are bad, um, but, you know, we do see these reoccurring issues, themes, and, and I think when you've, when, you've got, when you've got a situation like an implementation where the goals are diametrically opposed, you know, the situation is ripe for, um, misunderstanding, and, and that's kind of the breeding ground for, for the implementation failures that we see. Pretty well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, the, the people side of it is one of those things that a lot of times companies don't think about and the teams don't think about because they get so caught up in the technology itself and just trying to get the software itself to work. That'll, it's, easy, it's easy to overlook the, the people challenges and the, the, the softer side of it. Yeah, and I think if you overlook that, you really are you know, putting one heart, one arm behind your back. And you're really going to make it much more difficult for you to be successful you know, for the long term. Not not even only just for duration of that implementation project, but for the resulting product that comes out of it. it may not fully meet your expectations or your requirements. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So here, here's a loaded question for you. Then, so you've I know you've worked on both sides of the the equation in terms of plaintiff, the, the company that's suing someone, and then the defendant, the one that's defending themselves against the plaintiff, which is usually the, the software vendor that, or the system integrator that's being sued. But in your experience, who's most commonly at fault? Is there is there a party that you, you prefer to represent or, or that you feel more comfortable representing because you feel like the other party is going to be more likely to be at fault? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And, and, and look, I'll tell you, my, I started my career primarily representing software. Okay, so I've got a pretty good understanding of software vendor tactics, integrator tactics, and really what the expectations are with respect to the implementation on the vendor side. Um, later in my career, and it wasn't necessarily a conscious decision, it just kind of happened over time, we started representing licensees, the customers, against the software vendors. And so I think I can fairly say that in almost any implementation project that we've been involved in, there's blame to go around. Right? There, there's, there's a legitimate finger to be pointed at, at parties. And maybe even more, if there, there are other consultants, consulting companies involved, I don't know. So, you know, to, the simple answer to your question is, is there's blame everywhere. The cases that we take, you know, we do a, a very good job on the front end to make sure that the customer allegations are valid, that there's a reasonable basis for making the claims that 
making that are supported by evidence. Uh, so, you know, to say that when we're representing customers, typically it's the vendor that's at fault. It, you know, like I said, it, it, it may not be a technology issue that is, is the impetus of the failure, but it could be, you know, it, maybe it wasn't done with, with ill intent, but you know, overselling of the software, minimizing the software shortcomings, and the, the need or desire to break out into a particular industry where the software may not have been used before. You know, we see that kind of stuff happen all the time. It's, you know, it's, it's, the software is massively oversold. The salespeople don't care. They're, you know, they're there to, to sell the sizzle, right? And, you know, when you get a hamburger and you thought you were getting filet mignon, you, you're going to have a problem. With it. So, you know, I think, I think certainly, you know, cases we deal with, it's, it's almost always the vendor that has done something. The software did not live up to the representations that were made by the salespeople. The salespeople were incented by, you know, bonuses, uh, they had to make their numbers, didn't really fully vet what the business requirements were that were presented, or they didn't care, they didn't understand them. So th those are the types of things that we see uh, in almost every case that we deal with. So. Right. Yeah. And, and one of the challenges of, of these sorts of cases, and I'm certainly obviously not an attorney and I don't get involved in other things outside of the transformation or digital transformation space, but it seems like these sorts of projects would be a bit more gray in terms of uh, the who's right and wrong, just because there's so many variables and complexities and things that go into making these projects successful. Unlike, for example, I know you do intellectual property and other types of uh, law practice that might be a bit more cut and dry. But in these sorts of cases, it is common that we are involved in expert witness uh, reporting and, and depositions and testimony where we can't really pin the blame on one party or solely on one party. Oftentimes it's, it's kind of a, a mix of things that, that merge together to create these problems. And usually it's not squarely on one party. That, that, that's well said. And the goal in any one of these cases is you've got to find the case, right? There's going to be a point at which decisions that, that were made, you could not recover from. And like I said, there's going to be decisions on the customer side that were poor, and there were decisions on the vendor side that were poor. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard because it is very much a great, you know, I mean, is it a misrepresentation for, for the vendor to say, well, yeah, the software could do that. You know, they don't tell you that their view is that software can do anything with enough modifications. And that's that actually probably true. But what they're not telling you is it's going to cost hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of dollars to customize the software in that way. Well, good. Well, when we come back, we're, we're going to take a quick break. I want to ask you about your most memorable lawsuit that you've been involved with and see what kind of lessons we can take away from that. And uh, we'll get back to the, the questions here in just a second. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. And it doesn't matter anyway. You will never understand it because it happens to fast. And it feels so good. It's like walking the glass. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. All right, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. I'm here with Marcus Harris talking about digital transformation and enterprise technology lawsuits and failures. And Marcus, we were talking a bit before the break about some of the challenges that you, you commonly see in these sorts of projects and whose fault it is and that sort of thing. But I, I guess if we dig down a little bit deeper and, and look at one specific example, what is, if you have one, what is the most memorable lawsuit that you've been involved with either because it was such a big disaster or it was just so unique or 
Is there anything that stands out is, is without mentioning obviously the confidential names of the parties and that sort of thing and, and who won and all that good stuff. Um, no, I've, I've got a few. It's, it's hard to pick because, you know, there's, there's big players like SAP or smaller players. Um, I won't, I won't name names. Um, some of them are massively high dollar. These failures are enormous. Um, but the one that stands out most to me is being most unique. And this is one that you were actually involved in, um, an expert witness perspective. It was a case that involved, um, software that was, was meant to essentially, uh, track atmospheric gas canisters. That, 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 there was more to it than that. Fundamentally, that's what it was. And apparently, that was a very unique, unusual thing for software to do, just the process by which it was sold. It was, uh, it was leased, and then it came back, and it, it was always owned. And it, was, it was an unusual way to kind of uh, divvy up product and manage product. And fundamentally, if the software couldn't, couldn't function the way that it, that it had been represented by the software. But that, that in and of itself isn't unusual. But what was really unusual, <clears throat> I think you've got to point some blame at the customer here, is that the customer viewed software implementations as being as simple as turning on a light. Okay? And their view of the process was, we don't want to be involved at all. We want minimal involvement. We don't have the time. We don't have the resources, nor do we have the desire to become experts on some kind of technological system that's not within our wheelhouse. And so what we are going to do is cede ownership of this project, essentially, to the software vendor. The software vendor, in this case, was also the integrator. And so you can imagine how that ended up. The integrator basically had free reign to run amok billing and hours, it was like a, a sailor, a drunken a drunken sailor on a dock with, with swigging billable hours, it was staggering, but, you know, it just, just, it was just a, a milking the client, like you would not believe. It. It's a very, very vivid analogy there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a vivid case, don't, don't get me going. Um, and so, you know, the, the client uh, was in a unique industry vertical that the software vendor really wanted to get into, and the software vendor really had no understanding of the nuances of, of that particular industry. And they had they had designed and developed their base software. Well, no, let me step back. They, they, they took their base software that was really not designed for that industry at all. They hired some industry experts with a dubious reputation and dubious skill set to come in and tell them how that industry worked. And then they modified the software based on those representations. And it really was so idiosyncratic that it just didn't work. This thing was just a nightmare. It went on forever. Massive legal fees, um, massive liability. It was just a, it was a tough case for me. It was, it was a fun case too. Yeah, yeah, and, and you you bring up a really good point around you know when we think about risk and the probability of failure, and, and most people don't want to think that way, and you don't want to be overly negative and go in in total defense, but. You know, it's it's a lot easier to think about risk and play defense early on rather than waiting till we get to that tipping point that you talked about earlier. But it it seems like that the the more complex, the more unique, and the more just you just unique, I guess is probably the best word. The, the more unique the company is, either it's because they're in a unique industry or within their industry they're very unique. Uh, it seems like there's just a higher likelihood of failure because you, you're you're straining the norm, if you will. You're straining what technology can usually do, and you're probably imposing more change on your organization that's creating a whole other set of, of uh, risks and, and challenges. Would you agree with that, or do you see any patterns? There? I don't have any data, data to back this. It's just more of a qualitative observation, but did, do you see anything similar to that in, in the patterns of what you've seen? Yeah, I, th I think if you've got a really unique industry that doesn't do business like other people do business, then the likelihood that your implementation is going to fail, that software is not going to be suited to you, is really is really pretty high. And so, yeah, we we do see that. It's it's you know someone's got a very unique process, or the product set is just so unusual. You know, we had a a, a case with a large wire manufacturer and, distri and distributor, and essentially 
you know, the, the product came in as product A, and then they twisted it, dyed it, and, you know, did some other things to it, sold it in different sizes. And that, that piece of wire had to be tracked from, you know, the moment it came into the company to whatever spools it had been uh, put on and then divided out to the airplane that it was in because it was that critical of a piece of product. And this standard software, which is a, a software vendor that we all know, just couldn't do it, you know. So that that's not the same case. It's a different case, but it's a it's a it was a unique application of how that company did business that was unlike a standard manufacturer or distributor. And the software just, you know, really wasn't well suited to to that environment at all. So I totally agree. Yeah. So along those same lines then as we, as we're talking about risk then and we're talking about defense and how can we proactively avoid the need to have to hire someone like you later on, what are some of the biggest things that you would recommend to companies to, to avoid failure in the first place so they don't get to that tipping point that you mentioned before? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a tough question because there's so many things, right? But I think fundamentally, you've got to have realistic expectations about what is right in front of you, about you know, what you're getting into. Because if, if you think that this is going to be like a light switch going on and off and you're not going to have any involvement in the process, you're sorely mistaken and you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, you know, if you're, if, you're going to, if you're going to try to you know, not adapt to the software and you know, pay for a whole bunch of customizations or modifications to the code to make that software look and function like your legacy software system, that's not a good place to be either, right? So I think you know, flexibility understanding what you're getting into and having realistic expectations as to what the cost, the, the involvement and the impact is going to be in your business of that implementation. And you know, what, what is a realistic outcome for you from the implementation? You know, it, it's not a panacea, right? And it, it's not gonna be able to, to there's gonna be functionality gaps. And you've gotta be able to figure out what those gaps are early on, if you can deal with them and, and how to get around them in a reasonable manner. So I think that's the biggest thing that I think people that fail, you know, just have unrealistic expectations, whether it's a, a technology expectation or whether it's a process expectation. Is that key into kind of what you see as well? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you hit a really important one, which is that the first thing you mentioned around unrealistic expectations, I, I think so many problems are caused by the fact that if I'm implementing, I just, for whatever reason, whether it's my fault or not is a whole nother story, but I, I have unrealistic expectations. I think this is going to be as easy as flipping a switch. And, and I blame the vendors largely for that because I think that's part of their sales messaging and especially with the advent of the cloud and cloud technology and uh, just general advancements in technology, it becomes almost like it's a selling point that, hey, this is gonna be super easy and it's not gonna be that complex and we've taken the risk out of your implementation. And, it, and if I buy into that and I set my plan and my budget and my resource commitments and all that stuff based on unrealistic expectations, I'm going to, I'm going to end up making a bunch of bad decisions later on because I have to, because now I'm out of money, I'm out of resources, I'm out of time because I, I drew a line in the sand based on faulty assumptions. So I agree with that. That's one of the biggest, if not, you could argue that's probably the biggest um, root cause, at least of what we see with failure. Yeah, I, I do too. And, and you know, I think one of the ways to mitigate that is to just kind of benchmark where, where you know, companies of your size have been, what, you know, not only what they've spent, what the outcome was, how involved they were. It's not easy to get that information, but I think companies that take that extra step can really have an understanding of what they're doing. They, they're, they're more successful than you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I think you hit a, a really important point is it, it should be based on actual results, not just past proposals that the sales rep has done for other companies like yours, because those proposals may be just as flawed as the one they're, they're offering to you. Yeah. And you've got to do your own research too, because, you know, a, a vendor will say, well, don't, you know, don't worry about that. You know, we'll, we're going to take you out to uh, for site visits to customers that have implemented the software that are in your industry, that are similar size, they're wildly successful. That is a little bit deceptive. Now, a lot of times what you don't realize is that those customers are hosting you on site because they're getting discounts on their software. So they're incented to tell you positive things to upsell that software, you know. So we see that happen pretty regularly. And a lot of times, you know, the way a particular one of these, these customer sample customers, I guess, uses the software 
may have really no relation to the way that you use it. Your business might be different, might be it might be similar, it might be in the same industry, but what you need may not be what they need. They may not be even using the same type of functionality that's critical to you. So they have no idea whether that piece of, of that product actually works well. So. Right. Yeah. So if if I'm on a project team or part of an organization that's going through a transformation right now, and I'm starting to see signs of trouble, and, and this is a tough question because everyone's going to see signs of trouble. You're going to run into hiccups and roadblocks and challenges and thing, things you've got to work through. But at some point, you, you know, that trouble starts to build up and snowball. And like you said before, you reach that tipping point and then you're, you're at that point of no return where you've got to do something more drastic, like, like uh, potentially file legal action. But if I start to see trouble, I mean, what do I do? How do I, how do I, um, how do I right size things? How do I get things back on track? How do I, you know, even when things start to get a little difficult, how do I, how do I avoid the need to end up in litigation? Well, I think this is where good project management comes, comes into play at least from my perspective. What we, what we try to do in almost every contract that we draft, put a robust project management paragraph or provision, some language detailing what happens when there's an issue? How is that, how is that issue escalated? Um, that's one piece of it. And I think if you, you've got to have some sort of really solid change management process so that you know exactly, okay, well, that's not going the way that you're supposed to go. What do we do now? All right? Let's, let's stop, assess, figure out how this is going to impact the overall project. Um, so that's another thing too. But, I also think we have to have insight into the project. And if, you, if you don't have a, a contractual obligation on that vendor to provide you standard project status updates and, and the tools for you to have some some transparency into what's really going on, so that's going to be problematic because then you're not even going to see problems that happen. So, it, you know, and there's a whole other discussion as to you know, how they draft these project status updates, what what they actually tell you if anything how helpful they are to you, but you know, those are the typical tools and you want to make sure that, that you have a, a contractual obligation on the vendor in your agreements for them to be using those processes because if not, you know, you're not even going to know there's a problem. So it's, it's really, I go, I go back to this concept a lot, it's trying to leverage that contract negotiation process and the resulting agreement as a management tool to mitigate the likelihood that there are going to be problems. Or at the very least, if there are problems, you have a process in place to deal with that everybody has already agreed upon. You know, because you don't want surprises. And I think you, know, you can't contract for every eventuality or every possibility, but you know, you've got to give yourself a dog in the fight. And if you've got an experienced attorney, you know, or even, it doesn't even matter, attorney, you know, if they're a contract specialist, contract negotiator, Someone that's really skilled that's gone through this you know, multiple times knows what to put into the statements of work and manage the process. That's what you need. If you don't have that, I don't know how you're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, and there's, it's almost like you have to have a, uh, you have to be able to straddle the line between being optimistic and having a clear vision and wanting to do things right, but then at the same time having this little mechanism in your brain that says, okay, I also have to look at the, the downside or the negative side of things. And I think a lot of times when companies start these projects, they get so enamored by the possibilities and the technology and all the great things that could come of this, which is, which is good. You don't want to lose sight of that, but you also don't want to be blinded to the fact that you've got risk. You mentioned before, no system is perfect, especially if you're a unique business or uh, you have complex operations, you're inevitably going to strain the system. You're, the transformation is going to be a strain on the organization. And not to say that you shouldn't do it, but you should recognize that there are risks there and we need to figure out how we're going to mitigate those risks. So I think that's where a lot of people, you know, the human spirit being more optimistic than not, I think oftentimes you get blinded by the fact that, yeah, you can be optimistic, have a vision, try to do things right, but also recognize you're not going to do everything right. You're going to have challenges. What do you do? How do you identify those risks before they become too much of a problem? Absolutely. I think the problem that I see a lot is people don't want to think that way right? because, you know, they'll get, you know, they'll do a, these implementation projects can be huge, right? We've got a really big one going on now um, where there's just multiple third party pieces of software that, that complement the SAP system. And, you know, you're dealing with not only 
high end, you know, people in the IT department, the technology department, client, uh, uh, but we're dealing, you know, with kind of lower end people, HR people, and, and, and these people have been tasked with kind of managing a small piece of the implementation because it's a, it's a particular module or a specific type of product that is for their department. And, you know, they're so enamored with the technology and they're so excited about it. They just want to get the contract signed and they want to get done. You know, you've got to be the guy that says, well, well hold on. Here are all the horrible things that can happen. But people discount it. And they say, oh, that's not going to happen to us. Or, no, you know, we, we don't need to do that. Let's just get the contract signed. It's only a $100,000 piece of software. And we don't want to spend the money to negotiate the contract because it's, it's a low risk. You know, that, that kind of thinking of it back to what you meant. You need to put the time in on the phone to avoid putting the time in. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree with you. And that's a it's a good good place to leave it too. I think that if there's one takeaway, it's it's probably that. You know, it's, you need to take the time to um, really go in with your eyes wide open and see the blind spots, but also obviously see the, the, the good stuff that will come from the transformation as well. Well, good. Well, thanks for being here, Marcus. How, how do people get a hold of you? How can we find you? How can we learn more about you? Yeah. Um, you can send me an email at mharris at taflaw.com. That's my, my website as well, Taflaw, large, uh, less based uh, law firm that does a variety of things, not just technology law, software law. Um, mharris at taflaw is, is the best way to get a hold of you. Great. Well, thanks for being here. Appreciate your time and uh, look forward to chatting with you soon. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks, Marcus. Did you ever see a man with no heart? Baby, that was me. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberley. I'm here with Parisa Noble. Uh, Parisa, interesting conversation, interesting, scary, uh, you know, educate, enlightening all at the same time. What, what are your thoughts on that conversation? All the, above, all the above. It's always so interesting to hear Marcus's insights because he, he mentioned that he started off representing the software vendors and now he's representing the client. So he's seen both perspectives. He's played on both sides. So just the wealth of knowledge that he has is incredible. And I think one of the most important uh, questions that you may have asked him is, you know, how can you avoid litigation? You know, if you start to see trouble, how can you avoid it? And his answer was, it goes back to our last episode when he brought it in with the contract negotiations. It's being proactive um, and, you know, starting from the beginning with including a robust project management element in the initial contract so that if things start going south, it's, you know, you have a plan in place to escalate the problem. So that, that sparked a question for me is, what's a good plan? You know, what kind of plan should you have in place? Um, you know, he mentions figure out the way that you want to manage um, the challenge. What have you seen work um, in these situations that companies can incorporate into their contracts as they go into these conversations? Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, I think first of all, I, I could, maybe it's easiest to start with what you don't do. What you don't want to do is, is take the proposed plan and statement of work at face value and just sign off on that and assume that because they're the experts, um, they know best and therefore this must be the best answer for us. We sign a contract that kind of boxes us into a certain scope or um, a certain estimated cost or in some cases maybe even a fixed bid uh, or not to exceed a scenario. Now, the reason I say that you don't want to do that is because you know, vent two reasons. One is the vendors are coming in and they're, they're still in sales mode. I mean, when you sign a contract, everything up until you signing on the dotted line, you are being sold to. And so the incentive is to 
I don't want to say the incentive is to lowball the estimate, but the incentive is to, you know, downplay the risk, downplay the cost, and maybe assume a best case scenario. That's that's one problem. The other problem is the vendor, the software vendor, the system integrator, is only one part of the transformation. Uh, they're they're an important part of it, but there's a lot more that happens outside the scope in the realm of what a vendor does. And so what we see is a lot of times companies will say, okay, this vendor proposed you know a 12 month implementation for a million dollars let's just say and so they say okay our budget's a million dollars and we have 12 months to do it but what they fail to realize is well there's all this other stuff that the vendor's not doing that's going to add time and cost to to your project and it may not be cost that's to the vendor it may be to other third parties it may be internal cost um, for example i'll give you you know a common example uh, when you look at things like uh, change management, uh, anything to do with organizational change, you know, redefining roles and responsibilities and training, communications, all that stuff, or data migration, you know, cleansing the data, mapping the data, migrating it all over, testing the data. Those are two areas that very commonly are going to add to your project duration and, and probably your cost as well. So back to your point, Marcus's point, you, you, you want a good solid plan, but you, you have to almost translate what the vendor's providing in their proposal, in their SOW. You have to add a dose of reality to it. You have to know that they're assuming the best case scenario. They're probably being a little too aggressive in terms of how quickly they can implement. And they're sort of kicking the problem down the road because down the road, you're going to eventually have to deal with that and say, wow, it's it's going to take more than 12 months. It's going to cost us more than a million dollars. Now I've got to get a change order with a vendor or whatever. So they're, you know, it's, they're putting these perfect scenarios in front of you, but these implementations are not perfect. But what you can do is add a dose of reality and add all the missing pieces to that plan before you kind of sign off on the dotted line and draw, you know, put a stake in the ground saying this is our, our timeline and our budget and our plan. Right. I love add a dose of reality because you guys were talking about um, in your interview about how some people get very enamored by a new technology, something that can streamline processes. They just want to say, okay, tell me where to sign. Um, so I guess a note to our listeners, be the Scrooge <laughs> be right. the person that talks about, you know, what could go wrong and explain why and position it as, you know, we just need to put it in the contract so that if it happens, we're covered, we know what we're doing and we aren't blindsided. Have you ever seen, uh, do, you, do you recall the character uh, Debbie Downer from Saturday Night Live? Oh, yeah. You, you kind of have to be a Debbie Downer during this. And I've been accused of being a, De a Debbie Downer at times uh, when it, we're, we're having these conversations with the clients because, you know, you look over here, sales rep is super gung-ho, like, oh, our software is great. You're going to do this for, you know, 12 months and a million dollars. It's going to totally change your business. And you don't want to lose that excitement and vision, but you also want to have that Debbie Downer in you that says, well, but, you know, things could go wrong. Wah, wah. Wow. And <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Um, you have to have that mentality to kind of, be excited, have the clear vision, be aggressive, manage the project well, but also realize that these are complex. There's a lot more to it than what the vendors usually will propose to you. Right. And another thing too, that I thought was interesting um, that Marcus mentioned is that, you know, obviously you're going to have two conflicting motives when you look at the customer and the vendor, you know, the customer wants the ERP to be implemented as quick as possible at the most effective cost while the vendor is like, what customer customizations and modifications can we do for you? You know, they almost mm -hmm. are incentivized by the project taking longer. So that in its core is going to cause some type of misalignment if not handled correctly. So I guess what is the word to the wise? How do you find the middle ground and alleviate that pain point? Yeah, it, 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 two things. One is it becomes a project governance issue. So you have to have really good project governance that you, the client, control, not don't rely on your vendor to do this because to your point, they, they do have conflicting incentives with what your, your incentives are as an organization. So you want to, and, and not only that, by the way, but you as an organization implementing new technology, you, you need to own it. I mean, just to be successful and that be self-sustaining and not, you know, not totally outsource or defer to a vendor, you, you've got to have control and to have control, you've got to have good project governance that you, you've, um, uh, developed for your, your situation or for your transformation. So that's the first thing is to have that clear project governance. And the other thing is, um, as you get into the implementation, inevitably people are going to want to customize, not just the vendor, to your point, they, they make more money. And a lot of times they have a, a techie development mentality. So they're, you know, their instincts are to go develop stuff and build stuff. But 
even your own users or employees are going to say, well, I like my old spreadsheet. It did this and that. This new system doesn't do that. So I want to change it to look more like my old spreadsheet. And so you have to differentiate that scenario, which is probably just a sort of resistance to change versus a situation where um, this is our secret sauce. I mean, this is really what gives us a competitive advantage. Technology can't do that. And if it did do it, it wouldn't be a competitive advantage because everyone would be using that same technology, doing the same thing. So therefore, you know, we need to figure out how to reconcile that. Chances are you're not just going to give up your competitive advantage and defer to what the technology does. And you're going to end up, you know, either heavily configuring or maybe even customizing uh, the software. So it's a slippery slope and you have to differentiate between the change management related request to change the software versus the, this is a core competitive advantage. And it does all come back to governance with the right project governance. You can manage that well. And if you have a good business case that you can track to that says, you know, does this added cost and risk and time help us achieve our business case or not? And if not, then we're not going to do it. If it does, then sure, we're, we might be willing to take that on, but those should be exceptions, you know, where we do do it. But I think the problem is so many companies, they just, they have trouble differentiating between the two. Right. That makes sense. And, you know, that kind of takes me back to your conversation with Amanda. You know, if you have a company that's super unique, I mean, he was talking about one of his favorite cases with the uh, software that was meant to track atmospheres, atmospheric gas canisters, right? Yeah. That's a pretty customized element that's kind of hard to hit. So, I mean, tell me a little bit about what that means if your company is so unique and your products or your processes are so unique and far out there, you know, are there more dynamic systems that can accommodate when you start getting way out into left field of a company that does things super different? Or is there any scenario where a company would be better off creating their own in-house systems? Great question and great observation. I mean, it's, you're onto it. I mean, you, you have to, in those cases, you really have to think outside the box of what the industry or what the technology industry is telling you. The, the technology industry, especially the big software vendors like SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, all those guys, they're telling you that custom software is bad. <laughs> and the reason it's bad is because they want you to buy their software. And there are benefits, obviously. I mean, there's a lot of companies where I would never suggest, you know, any sort of custom developed software because there's, you know, there's off the shelf software that could do it. So why create the wheel? But to your point in your example, with the atmospheric gas manufacturing company or you know any other company that has something that's so unique about their business model um, that off-the-shelf software may not be able to handle it there's a couple options one is before you necessarily get on the path of custom development as a as a plan a you could also look at more of a best of breed approach where i go out and i find different systems that maybe can't do everything i want but they each piece of it might handle one piece of my business really well and i sort of piece together a cohesive solution that's easier said than done, but you tie together multiple systems that can handle the different, you know, functions or unique aspect of my operations. That's not the end of the world either. Again, a big software vendor might tell you that is wrong. You should not do that because now you've got integrated systems and now your data gets messy. True, there are risks no matter which way you go, but you have to look at, okay, those are risks, but is that risk greater than just not being able to automate my business or worse yet, giving up my competitive advantage or totally given up my business model that's made me successful just so I can use it off the shelf software. And that's the kind of question you have to ask. And, and if that doesn't work, if those custom or if those uh, best of breed patched together solutions don't work, or you, you find that that's not going to cut it, um, then that's, you know, that may be where you go down the custom development road. Most of the time, it's pretty rare though, to be honest, that we end up in that plan C call it. Most of the time you end up in sort of a plan B with maybe a little bit of spot custom technology to patch together or to fill some of the gaps. So usually it ends up being sort of a more of a hybrid. So where you can use a lot of off the shelf software, may not be one big ERP system, but you've got multiple systems and then you can custom develop, you know, the rest of it typically. Right. So it's more of that like white glove fit. That makes sense. Yeah. And then the other thing too, that I was curious about was, you know, it sounds like, and we've talked about this before. I mean, for example, take Microsoft Dynamics, um, they're, they're serving multiple hundreds, thousands of different companies, right? And those companies are seeing success, but it might not be successful for your company. And it sounds like the root cause of any ERP failure comes down and comes back to the people behind it, whether it's the people on the client side or the people 
on the vendor side. And a lot of the time, if it's on the vendor vendor side, it sounds like it's coming from the sales rep, right? It's coming from those expectations, you know, overselling the software, minimizing the shortcomings, um, not being fully transparent about what the software can do. So I guess, you know, would you say that these companies, if they're not already, should companies like Microsoft and Oracle, et cetera, should they have like liability elements in place for their sales reps to mitigate that? Because ultimately, if it comes down to their sales reps, who's who's responsible? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good question. I don't know that I have a good answer for you other than to say, you know, they end up they end up taking liability for the sales reps uh, or forced into taking liability through the courts a lot of times. Uh, you know, they do have insurance, I think, that'll pay for, you know, when they get sued. Um, so that that's that is part of it. But to your point, you know, if, if I'm a huge software vendor and I've got hundreds or thousands of sales reps that are all human and they're all being incentivized to sell as much software as possible, you're, you're going to get some bad behavior there. And it's different shades of gray. You know, not all of them are bad. Some of them are more above board than others. But, you know, you, you have to look at the realities. They're human and you're incentivizing them to or they're being incentivized to sell software. They're not being incentivized to make your business successful. Um, and they're not being incentivized to be realistic about what they propose to you. They're being incentivized to close the deal. So um, that's a that's a broad stereotype. I mean, you could argue that longer term, it's going to catch up to them. But I've been doing this for 20 some years and it's still happening. A lot of the same stuff that was happening when I first started my career is still happening today. So not a lot has changed on that front. Um, but I think, I think it's just important to be aware and not assume that the vendors are somehow going to take responsibility or, you know, somehow be above board at all times. You have, you have to take responsibility for your own implementation at the end of the day. That's all right. It's you that's investing. It's you that's managing it. So yep. you own it. Usually that helps the situation. Yep. Absolutely. Well, good. Well, well, thanks again for uh, another good episode of Parisa. Thanks to our guests for being here. Uh, and most of all, thank you the listeners for, for joining us today. Again, we're on live on YouTube every Wednesday at 10 a.m., U.S. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. London, 11 p.m. Hong Kong. Be sure to subscribe to us on uh, Google, uh, Spotify, Apple, whatever podcast platform you use. And also be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube as well. You can search up uh, Eric Kimberling and or Third Stage Consulting, two different channels, lots of great content, independent technology, agnostic content. Hope to see you there and uh, hope to see you in the next week's episode. I hope you all have a great day, and we'll see you in the next episode of Transformation Ground Control.